The novel coronavirus is spreading rapidly across India after infecting more than 456,000 people and killing over 14,000 till now. The lockdown that followed the global health crisis has left India's economy in a battered state. The government is trying to ease restrictions to revive the economy, but the virus continues to create havoc across the country. Today, India reported its highest single-day surge in coronavirus cases. In the last 24 hours, the country recorded almost 16,000 new positive cases and 465 deaths. There has been a consistent surge in the number of new cases and deaths. In the previous week alone, the country witnessed more than 102,000 fresh COVID-19 cases and over 1,900 deaths. However, the number of cured and discharged patients continue to be higher than active cases. Yesterday, the government carried out more than 215,000 tests. All right, uh, we are now cutting across uh, to Geeta Gopinath of the IMF. Let's listen. This crisis is a crisis like no other and will have a recovery like no other. First, the unprecedented global sweep of this crisis hampers recovery prospects for export-dependent economies and jeopardizes the prospects for income convergence between developing and advanced economies. We are projecting a synchronized deep downturn in 2020 for both advanced economies and emerging market and developing economies with over 95% of countries projected to have negative per capita income growth in 2020. Now, the cumulative hit to GDP growth over 2021 for emerging markets and developing economies, excluding China, is expected to exceed that in advanced economies. Now, second, as countries reopen, the pickup is uneven. On the one hand, Pent-up demand is leading to a surge in spending in some sectors like retail. On the other hand, contact intensive sectors like hospitality, tourism and travel remain depressed. So countries that are heavily reliant on these sectors are likely to be deeply impacted for a prolonged period. Third, the labor market has been severely hit and at record speed and particularly so for lower income countries, lower income uh, workers and semi-skilled workers who do not have the option of teleworking. With activity in labor intensive sectors like tourism and hospitality expected to remain subdued, a full recovery in the labor market may take a while, worsening income inequality and raising poverty. Now on the positive side, the recovery is benefiting from exceptional policy support, particularly in advanced economies and to a lesser extent in emerging market and developing economies that are more fiscally constrained. Global fiscal support now stands at over $10 trillion and monetary policy has eased dramatically. In many countries, these measures have succeeded in improving livelihoods and preventing large-scale bankruptcies, thus helping to reduce lasting scars and aiding a recovery. Now, this exceptional support, particularly by major central banks, has also driven a strong recovery in financial conditions, despite grim real outcomes. Equity prices have rebounded, credit spreads have narrowed, and portfolio flows to many emerging and developing economies have stabilized alongside some currencies appreciating that were previously depreciating. So by preventing a financial crisis, policy support has helped avert worse real outcomes. At the same time, the disconnect between real and financial markets raises concerns of excessive risk taking, and this is a significant vulnerability. So we are definitely not out of the woods we have not escaped the great lockdown. Given this tremendous uncertainty, policymakers should remain vigilant and adapt policies as the situation evolves. 
substantial joint support from fiscal and monetary policy will need to be continued, especially in countries where inflation is projected to stay low. At the same time, countries should ensure proper fiscal accounting and fiscal transparency and ensure that central bank independence is maintained. Now, our priority is to manage health risks as countries reopen. This requires continuing to build health capacity, widespread testing, tracing, isolation, and practicing safe distancing. These measures help contain the spread of the virus, reassure the public that new outbreaks can be dealt with in an orderly fashion, and minimize economic disruptions. The international community must further expand financial assistance and expertise to countries with weaker health capacity. Much more needs to be done to ensure adequate and affordable production and distribution of vaccines and treatments when they become available. Now, in countries where activities are being severely constrained by the health crisis, people directly impacted should receive income support through unemployment insurance and cash transfers and impacted firms should also be supported through loans, credit guarantees and grants. Now to more effectively reach the unemployed in countries with large informal sector, the digital payment system should be expanded and complemented with in-kind support of, for food and medicine and other household staples channeled through local governments and community organizations. In countries that, are, that have begun to reopen, and where the recovery is underway, policy support will need to gradually shift towards encouraging a return to work and to facilitating a reallocation of workers from sectors that are shrinking to those that are growing. Now, this could take the form of spending on worker training and hiring subsidies that are targeted at workers that are at the greatest risk of becoming long-term unemployed. Now, supporting a recovery will also involve actions to repair balance sheets and address debt overhang. This will require strong insolvency frameworks and mechanisms for restructuring and disposing of distressed debt. Now, policy support should also gradually shift from being targeted to being more broad-based. Where fiscal space permits, countries should undertake green public investment to accelerate the recovery and support longer-term climate goals. To protect the most vulnerable in society, expanded social safety nets will have to remain in place for a long time. Now, the international community must ensure that developing economies have the financing that they need to undertake critical spending. This should take the form of concessional financing, debt relief, and grants. And also that emerging and developing economies have access to international liquidity via ensuring financial stability, financial market stability, central bank swap lines, and deployment of a global financial safety net. Now, this crisis will also generate medium-term challenges. Public debt is projected this year to reach the highest level ever, even past the World War II peak in both advanced and emerging market and developing economies. So countries will need sound fiscal frameworks for medium-term consolidation through cutting back on wasteful spending, widening the tax base, minimizing tax avoidance, and greater progressivity in taxation in some countries. At the same time, this crisis also presents an opportunity to accelerate the shift to a more productive, sustainable and equitable growth to investment in new green and digital technologies and wider social safety nets. Global cooperation is ever so important in this truly global crisis. All efforts should be made to resolve trade and technology tensions, which while improving the multilateral rules-based trading system. The IMF will continue to do all it can to ensure adequate international liquidity, provide emergency financing, support the G20 debt service suspension initiative, and provide advice and support to countries 
during this unprecedented crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gita. Uh, uh, we have a number of uh, questions uh, that have already come here. Uh, so let me start uh, with the uh, first question from uh, uh, the Daily Mail in the UK. The question is uh, whether this is the uh, uh, sharpest recession uh, since the Great Depression. This is an unprecedented crisis and this is indeed the worst recession since the Great Depression. It was already the worst recession since the Great Depression in April when we had projected growth for 2020 to be at minus 3 percent, but now at minus 4.9 percent, that is even even more strongly true. And no country has been spared. Both emerging market developing economies, advanced economies have all been very badly hit during this crisis. Thank you very much, uh, Gita. Uh, moving on to the uh, next question here from Eric Martin at Bloomberg. Uh, the question is, uh, the wheel highlights the disconnect between financial markets and economic fundamentals. Stock markets in particular are often several months ahead of the real economy. To what extent do you think the disconnect between financial markets and economic fundamentals may be explained by investors looking ahead on an economic rebound? This crisis has called for exceptional policy support, uh, both from fiscal policy and monetary policy, uh, and that has been delivered uh, this time around. Central banks, especially major central banks in, uh, in the world, have undertaken extraordinary steps to ensure smooth market functioning, keep interest rates low, provide liquidity. Now, what that has meant is that that has led to a substantial improvement in financial conditions since our last April outlook, and that seems somewhat disconnected by real outcomes. So I would say the two important factors uh, we think of as being important for this rebound in financial conditions is one, the extraordinary policy support, and second, that in the face of tremendous uncertainty about where the world economy is headed, I think markets are taking a more positive uh, outlook for the future. And I think the combination explains what we are seeing right now. Thank you, Gita. Uh, uh, moving to a question from Ikai and uh, moving to uh, the recovery. The question is, what kind of recovery uh, are you expecting? Is it more likely to be V, U, or W shape? What is the major challenge down the road uh, for the recovery? So the worst for the global economy was what we saw in the first and second quarter of this year, and especially uh, in the second quarter for most uh, economies. So that was the depth of the collapse. Now, since then, if you look at uh, recent data that's coming in, you do see signs of improvement. In some places, there's still a contraction, but it's a smaller contraction. But in others, we're actually seeing signs uh, of expansion, at least those who've opened up for a while. Now, we describe the recovery as still highly uncertain in terms of the strength of the recovery. So while we could say that maybe the world has bottomed out for now and we are in a recovery phase, but still the strength of the recovery is highly uh, uncertain because there is no solution yet to the health crisis. So outcomes could be on the plus positive or the negative side. You could have better news on treatments and vaccines and the improvement could be even faster. Uh, but it could also be worse if indeed the virus cannot be contained and you have second waves. Uh, in addition, you have concerns about escalating trade tensions, geopolitical tensions, and also a reversal in financial conditions. So a tightening in financial conditions could uh, trigger debt distress. So we, this is highly uh, uncertain and it's uneven because some sectors are recovering much faster than contact intensive sectors like hospitality and tourism. Thank you, Gita. Maybe one last question before we move on to uh, uh, country and region specific questions. Uh, this question is uh, from La Tribune uh, and it's on debt. Uh, the question uh, is uh, governments are going in for massive fiscal stimulus globally uh, in response to the pandemic. How concerned are you uh, about the risk in the long term of rating downgrades or build up of debt, especially for emerging market countries? So this is a crisis that calls for substantial support uh, across all countries. Uh, and that is what we have seen happening in many countries of the world. In the absence of that support to protect livelihoods, 
and to prevent large-scale bankruptcies, if that was not in place, then we would have ended up with a recovery that would be much weaker and would have taken much longer to get back up to pre-crisis trends. So this is uh, an investment that countries had to make now. But keeping that in mind, indeed, when the recovery is stronger, uh, we are in a better place with the health crisis, better able to manage it, then countries will have to undertake medium-term fiscal management uh, and well, in a while through a combination of expenditure and revenue measures. And as of now, uh, countries should make sure that they are following best practices, that they're putting proper safeguards in place, uh, using, you know, making sure there's proper fiscal accounting and uh, fiscal transparency. But as of now, the need of the R is for this kind of policy support. Thank you, Gita. Uh, so moving on to uh, uh, some uh, uh, country-specific questions, uh, uh, here's a question from uh, uh, Efe. Uh, given that the cases are growing in the U.S. and Latin America, could growth forecasts for both be downgraded in the near future? an important uh, downside risk. Uh, indeed, like All right, uh, that was Geepta Gopinath of the International Monetary Fund. The IMF says the global recession will be even worse than what it predicted some days ago. Global economy would shrink by close to 5% in 2020. All major economies in the world will contract this year. Even Indian economy will, suffer, will contract by minus 4.5% in 2020. All global economies would shrink this year except China, which will see a 1% growth in 2020. However, uh, the developed economies in the world will suffer the most, uh, especially some European economies, uh, which will suffer a minus 10% recession. Even America, the world's leading economy, would uh, shrink by close to 8% this year. All right, it's time for a very short break. We'll be back with news and updates on the other side. Stay with us.